Okay, hi, good evening everybody. Um, I'm gonna make a quick video to uh, explain, so gonna, that's going to attempt to explain one of the difficulties, just one of the difficulties that we have as a society mainly, not as individuals, but as, as a collective conversation to uh, talk about truth, the, the truth of, uh, of a matter. Um, what I'm going to explain um, has to do more with understanding the overall uh, existential condition after, on, uh, on which you may understand why arriving to seeing the truth about something that we may popularly or commonly think a certain way or a certain wrong way about is hard to, is hard to get to. Okay, um, conic, cognizant existence, human existence, it basically consists of two spheres. Our existence in this world consists of two simultaneous descriptions. One of, it, of which, our entire existence, living in the world, our existential condition. One is um, the sphere of the um, hard, written, or static reality. Everything that is uh, cemented into time through ink and words, or our material constructions, everything that we see physically, and everything that we read on a book that um, gets created. This is the, the static or the hard reality of our existence. And then there's the human or living reality. Okay, so first I'm gonna explain the human uh, living reality of our existence, which is the cognizance that occurs uh, through, our, through our brains, through our minds. Now our minds work in space. Our brain is still, uh, tr we're still trying to understand how our brain works. It seems to just come up with stuff. It sends information in all directions and parts of the brain that you thought, we're discovering the parts of the brain that we thought were about one of the ways that we categorize and start understanding life logically. It turns out that it was adaptable and really information and memories are stored all over the place and so what we're seeing is that the brain actually understands space just like our eyes understand space so our perception our cognizant perception of reality which is the greater reality the the reality that we all want to live freely in we don't want to exist within a book or within a house and never be able to leave the confines of a w written word or or the walls of a building the reality that we want is our free reality or our cognizant reality. That cognizant reality is made of, is uh, understood as space, meaning in space, in three dimensional space, a lot of things are happening at the same time. Where, while we may be focused on on a f a f a one thing or a few areas, there's lots of other things that are arriving uh, time is displacing in different areas of that space with different things that gather at different points as we move forward. Uh, it's a living, uh, thinking uh, reality cognizance. So, um, it's, it's a marvelous, the, the, the marvel of our, our, of our cognizance is, is something that we're just used to. It's basically um, within it, we're free to, to change our minds, to, uh, to experience things that we didn't think were going to happen, and to discover new things. The written reality, or the static reality, on the other hand, is created by our um, senses, ma mainly our hands, <laughs> and it is um, situated in time. And once we create it, it doesn't change. Now, our existence is a relationship of these two realities, of these two spheres of, ex 
these two existential spheres, these two spheres of existence, together. As you look around, you may look at the cord of your telephone, and you may think very close to its physical reality, the wires and the design and how the little curls uh, connect it to the tube and everything, but at the same time, the, 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 the cognizant the cognizant part of, uh, of, of the natural, organic, spatial reality may just throw at you that it reminds me of, it reminds you of a, a little girl's curls, locks in her hair, or, or maybe a wave. God knows what you came up with. And so this is always happening simultaneously. We're a, const we're a fusion of, of these two spheres. However, they live in a very, very uh, self, mutually afflicting, mutually affecting and mutually afflicting uh, relationship. We affect the re reality because we create it, and then we may grab it and change the form of it, and then put it back into the still world. Um, and we are afflicted because compared to our free spirit, spatial, organic human reality, the hard reality um, is always limiting, is what we use it. We may take a hammer and, wow, if it wasn't for that hammer, we wouldn't be able to build that house. But it is of a, almost like a, of a foreign dimension, a foreign creature. We, we don't live within it. It lives within our world. And yet... Um, we have conditioned and we run our world um, by this what sometimes is an enemy because if a house is ugly or if you make really bad laws for a country for example uh, they become almost the enemy they are a discomfort and yet all of the world is a written hard static reality and so we try to make this artifice the best we can but it never does justice to the freedom uh, of, um, of the organic or human sphere of reality. And this is essentially what explains why, for example, human sciences are always trying to catch up to nature. They're, we're inventing a vaccine, and then a decade later we find out that it caused cancer, and then we, we find a new type of organic medicine that's a different way of tackling the the uh, disease, because obviously there are parts of, or, of the organic sphere of life that we were not crazy about, <laughs> aggressive animals, <laughs> bacterial infections. And so we're thankful that we're so smart as to wield the, the static uh, hard reality. But at the same time, um, you know, it never, we don't want to fuse into it. We don't want to become... Uh, what was that, that that girl from Star Trek, Seven of Nine, or, you know, we, you know, we joke around, um, you know, and we're, we've got to be careful because we actually start believing things like that. And, and in fact, the world shows that. We show that we will go by what we have set down in words, and we will go by, we think that the idea of living in a glass box, you know, might be okay for for a, a lifetime and of course eventually after a few months we are going crazy inside that biosphere three because we can never really um foresee the failure of the of the hard static reality either uh it is so useful so great so wondrous what we can do with our uh intelligence and in, in the creation of this of artifices that we cannot we can't always predict it but it, we'd be wise to know that we should always stay with on our toes as far as not subscribing and not marrying, not fusing unconditionally to any aspect of written reality. That's why our government should be organic. They should always, the more we are able to design governments that are like living, uh, self-analyzing, self-criticizing, the, the detecting of their own mistakes, and, and, and detecting of how its institutions are starting to fail people or hurt people or not doing the job, that would be the ideal government. 
you know, it's always going to be imperfect. Okay, 10 minutes. I told this guy I was going to do it five or 10 minutes. So there's a 10 minute explanation of, uh, of the concept between the hard and the human or the static and the living or whatever names. I'm sure it's in a book someplace. I'm sure I didn't discover this. It must come from somebody, other people. I'm sure this is some kind of something, some kind of science human science somewhere. I haven't found it, but I found it this way, and I hope you all can appreciate it. And it actually, I'm going to just do one more minute. Um, when you understand this concept, it, uh, it just, it's not finite. In fact, we were talking about uh, what evidence does, and I'm starting to see how it connects to what we believe and we subscribe and we prescribe as a belief, as a social civil belief in society, and is evidence necessary? And I've always had, I've often had this argument with uh, some of the guys in the group where they, you know, they say, "Show me the evidence." And when I hear that, to me, it's like putting a stop on truth, because we're always going to discover what is wrong with the world we created. We need to be able to continue to discover how our civilization, our hard civilization is erring and hurting us. We need to discover why that vaccine was actually hurting us. We need to discover why asbestos was bad for our lungs. We need to discover how we were wrong about the things that we created and invented. And when um, people say, show me the evidence, it's almost like they're saying, I don't want to be human. I just, I just want to go by what I can count on in the written word and what I know I can, I can put my money on. You know, I can. This is what I, ha I wrote yesterday, and this is what we're going by. You know, I always get that feeling when people say, uh, "Show me the evidence." If we don't have a brain that can always turn around and explore our own inventions, we are lost. It's hopeless civilization. Would we might as well throw in the towel and <laughs> and give up because at the mo at the moment that we would that we would actually stop criticizing our own inventions and acknowledging that we are very likely <laughs> always wrong or maybe we're right enough for this it serves us for a while but we have to always leave open the door that we will eventually discover how we could have known better even before, although it served us this far. It's, we must always leave that door open um, for knowing that things can be better because ultimately what is happening is that we're coming back to nature. That's, that's like our journey. That's like the quest of humanity. We're um, using our brain to make nature uh, not hurt us, to... Uh, not to take advantage. We we use our brain because it's very it's all very interesting. I'm it, I'm starting to branch off to other things. But um, we want to survive. We want to uh, make life easier and so forth. Uh, the wisest thing that we could do is to concentrate and prioritize where the living organic world is harming where we're hurting and we need to heal, where there's something that can attack us in nature and we can defend or protect against. And then, in second priority, try to make 10,000 different flavors of potato chips, you know? But instead, our civilization right now is the other way around. We can't, we can't seem to turn it around and, and serve the whole of the species where we are led by our our, our avarice are sort of I want to eat, 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 eat like termites, you know, and so we 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 produce more than we need, and, and we're inverted. But the the quest and, and this, if we really focus and, and realize that what we're trying to do is just be able to go back to nature, like the New Agers say, you know, go back to the forest, except using our intelligence to. Uh, to enhance us in the way that, and to protect us, to keep us safe and more comfortable before uh, discomforts of nature, to make our death our a satisfying, pleasant, um, you know, event, not something that destroys us when we're not expecting it or accidents and people get killed and 
you know, or what uh, all the other things about nature, so that we don't suffer um, cataclysms of nature. This should actually be where we should use this amazing intelligence. When we do seize finally that um, that objective uh, for the for the species. Um, we will most likely be much more uh, versed, much more able and capable and flexible and versatile and changing on a, on a dime, you know, uh, turning on a dime and right away um, never being sure of anything we do and always be vigilant. We'll always be vigilant of our inventions and make sure that it's keep not harming this human body, this natural um, human part of our of our existence uh, of existence. Okay, that's it. Sorry, six minutes too long.